Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Northfield Podcast. I'm your host, Caleb Gordon. Thank you so much for taking time to be a part of the program. On the show today, we have Pastor Peter Johnson from Hope Presbyterian. And excited to have this conversation. Pray it blesses you, challenges you, and, and pushes you towards the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Love y'all. Have a fantastic day. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. Peter Johnson. Thank you, Caleb. Thanks Hi. for having me. How in the world are you doing? I am doing well. I am doing well. You're doing fantastic? I'm doing fantastic as, as an so adopted many people son say. of Oklahoma. I'm loving Bartlesville and I love Oklahoma. Okay, where, so where are you from originally? Southern California. Ooh. Yeah, brother, yeah. what? Brother, ooh. Yeah. Glendora, Glendora, California, San Gabriel Valley, Los Angeles County. But you, because you have a military background. I have military background. So is that where you were stationed? Did you do? No, it's where I grew up. Okay. And then um, grew up in a strong Christian home yep. in Southern California. And then um, had a dream since I was a little kid to be a wildlife biologist. I love the outdoors. I love hunting. Wait, wait, okay. So the, so, the, so the Presbyterian pastor wanted to be an outdoor biologist biologist yeah did you do that no look you no. never that never went that never happened i didn't consider god's providence <laughs> <laughs> uh, no it, yeah i mean it's like well you think of a river runs through it the presbyterian minister of montana fly fishing that's movie. one of my favorite movies i great movie. love that movie even a better book but yeah is it i've not read the book yeah, but book i a river runs through it is probably one of my i'd say top seven movies yeah I love that movie. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's, it's good. Um, okay, so you you how in the world did you get to Oklahoma from? Yeah, so California. I mean, this is. I mean, let, let me give you the thumbnail sketch. So yeah. I, I grew up in Southern California. Um, I went to college. I said, "Hey, I'm gonna join the army." So I did Reserve Officers Training Corps in the Army, which is a way to train Army officers in college, a civilian college. Yep. I'm studying biology. I'm going to do four years in the Army. I'm going to get out. I can get a doctorate in wildlife, whatever, and I'm going to like count bighorn sheep up in the Rocky Mountains. That's my life. I mean, that's that's where I'm headed. I mean, since I'm a little kid and then something happened. I got in the army and I actually liked it. You like the I army? Mean, I liked it. It was uh, I was a tank officer, armor with yep. tanks. And yep. uh, I went to Desert Storm as a tank platoon leader. And Thank then, you for your service. And then uh, I said, hey, you know, it came time. You have, you have a four year commitment. Sure. And I'm like. I have a choice to get out after my four-year commitment or stay in. And then um, the best way I can describe it is I was T-boned. What, what do I mean, T-boned? Yeah, T-boned. It's like I, I looked around. I saw these chaplains. Again, I'm an Army officer. I'm raised up in a Christian home. I'm 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 involved in Officers Christian Fellowship. Yep. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, I get this nagging. It's like, I should be a chaplain in the Army. And like, where did that come from? And I'd be like, you know, if God wanted to be a chaplain, guess what? I would have come in the army as a chaplain. Sure. Wouldn't have wasted all my time with Doing all for four yeah. to five years, whatever. Um, so um, then I'm the railhead commander and I'm shipping all these vehicles off to the National Training Center, Mojave Desert for training. And there's this beautiful second lieutenant. And uh, she and I start talking and <laughs> things happen. <laughs> things happen. <laughs> and uh, next thing I know I'm engaged and we're getting married Come in on. Fort Hood, Texas. And we both get out and I'm going straight to Fuller Seminary. Why Fuller? Because that's where I grew up in okay. Pasadena, California. I, I know nothing. If you were to say, hey, Pete, describe the difference between dispensationalism and reformed theology. I would say, what? I, I, what? You know, yeah. it's all Greek to me. Seminary is just going to be this intense Bible study. Sure. You know, it's going to be, sure. you know, good, rich devotions. Yep. I mean, I, I know nothing. And um, so I go to Fuller. We get, uh, Kathy and I get married. We I'm in seminary um, at Fuller and uh, finish that. And then I, I come back on active duty as an army chaplain. And uh, so I spent five years with tanks and then 20 years as an army chaplain. Um, and ended up having six combat deployments, all said and done, including Desert Storm. Um, and the then I just realized the, the ministry there was so yeah. rich um, that, um, you know, deployments were long and they were frequent. You know, a short deployment is nine months in combat, 11 months, 12 months are, are typical, nine to 12 months deployments. And so you're gone from your family. Everyone is. Um, 
to be very frank, people are killing other people and yep. people, you know, are dying. And, and so what happens is what is really important in life rises to the surface. And so these, um, everything just becomes, it's almost like putting on 3d glasses in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. People who aren't Christians are asking great questions. You're, you're forced to see the real issues in life. Yeah. What happens? Yes. When they, my best friend just died yesterday. Mm -hmm. what, what, where am I going? What does that mean? Yeah. What, come on. All of this. And so I, I, and then I'd come back and I'd tell Kathy, I said, man, the, the, the ministry and deployments is just so rich. Yeah. And then she would always say to me, she's like, okay, well, you know, this whole army thing is going to end, you know, you're going to retire one day. And what do you want to do after the chaplaincy? And I, I didn't want to go into the pastor. I, I really didn't. Yeah. I wanted to do something sort of like parachurch outdoor, yep. like yep. I'd be a fly fishing guide or, or whatever. A reformed John Eldridge. <laughs> a, a reformed John Eldridge hunting and talking about Jesus yeah. and, and all yeah. of that. Um, and I remember there was one deployment. I was on Bagram in, in Afghanistan, and uh, I was the pastor of Enduring um, Faith Chapel. And it just clicked. I had this yeah. Bible study. Um, I'm preaching. Um, I'm preaching the Reformed faith. Yeah. It's new to a lot of soldiers and yep. DA civilians, and they're asking questions. And I just like, I love this. Yeah. I love this. And I said, I got home from that deployment and I said to my wife, I said, um, I know what I want to do after the chaplaincy. I, I want a pastor. Yeah. I want to be a pastor of a church. And so um, to be very frank, the army changed. Um, so in my latter portions of the years, I just realized I got tired of covert ministry. Yeah. And and what I meant is what I mean is that, you know, you just you're tired of being careful with what you have to say yep. that that's just yep. where the government the culture the military was moving yep. and i said you know i'm thinking about getting out and it was it was it was time i i had nope. 25 years i, I sure. could retire um and um but it was just it, it it just wasn't the ministry um i was i was craving yeah and my friends oh pete gotta stay in you know soldiers need ministry i said they do but i feel like i want to go back on the front line Right. Well, so I'm leaving the military ministry wise to go back on the front lines to do, you know, I, I said, if I really want to do what I, if I really want to say and do what I want to do in the army, yeah. they're just going to show me the door. Anyway. Come on. It's just yep. not going to work. Yep. Um, if I do that in the civilian world, they can arrest me or whatever, yeah. you know, start, start a prison ministry. Yeah. Start, start a prison ministry. So, um, <laughs> So I reached this point. I was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and we had this huge project to turn into the Pentagon of restructuring the uh, the Army and Chaplaincy School. And I knew when we turned into this big project that the Pentagon would be like looking at it for the chaplaincy of the Pentagon. We'd be looking at it for a week and a half. So for a week and a half, we would have nothing to do because yeah. we're just waiting for we're them to respond. Done. Yeah, you, you got your we project We finished the done. big project. We're going to nope. have a week and a half. Well, that week and a half, you know, everyone's just drinking coffee, going in offices, talking. I'm in my office. And I'm like, like Pete, what are you doing? I'm like, working. <laughs> you know, what am I working on? I'm trying to find open churches. I'm trying to see about dropping my paperwork. And um, so it was exciting. I was like, wow, looking for churches opening. And yep. our army home was Fort Riley, Kansas. We had four assignments in Kansas. Loved them. First infantry division is, you know, I just love the first infantry division. And we saw this open church in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, have no roots here and met the people. And here we are, Pastor and Help Presbyterian Church in Bartlesville. So bananas. I uh, That is so cool. Uh, we met, you guys shortly came, you guys came. So your wife was involved in a ladies Bible study that my wife was involved in for a season. Mm -hmm. um, Carol Hudson was teaching it. Yeah. And um, so Jamie was there. Your wife was there. And that is, and she said, "You've got to, you've got to meet the new the new pastor at Hope Presbyterian." Because I had friends that had been going there. They were, you know, they hadn't found a pastor. They were looking, mm -hmm. and um, said, "You need to meet the new guy." And I think I was I I was slated to sp I was speaking at Grace Fest downtown. Yeah, and um, I came down off the platform and we shook hands. Right, and said, "I'm, I'm Peter." And I wanted to introduce you to your best friend. 
Yes, <laughs> that was it. That was it. And and so, and I, I and I told and I, back then I said I said I'd love to get you on the podcast. Then. Yeah. And so I what I've been doing is I'm I'm I've started this series of of interviewing pastors in our community, mm-hmm. just getting to know them, you know, just hearing their heartbeats, hearing what's going on. And um, you're the second guy that's done some uh, attempted to do, or you, you, you successfully did chaplaincy. Mm-hmm. Mike Scrivani, that was, oh yeah, he, he was going to, but mm-hmm. ended up not doing it. So it was, you know, that's, I find that when you say that, I was like, wait, I just had this conversation about chaplaincy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what, so what drew you to um, the reformed faith? And I, I, and I know the answer, but I mean, let's. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, a I good know, question. I know the, I know the, the theological answer, but let's, uh, let's. <laughs> it was all personal choice. <laughs> oh, okay. Fair enough. Okay, great. That's fantastic. No, so I, that's, a, that's a great question. So I think when I was in seminary, I, I thought I was reformed when I wasn't. And Fascinating I didn't cause... know what reformed really was. And what, what I mean by that mm-hmm. is I grew up in the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, PCUSA. Yep. Now, the church I grew up in was a conservative or PCUSA, evangelical church, probably not really reformed per se. But um, um, so I'm at Fuller, which yep. has a large PCUSA. Which, by the way, Fuller is not exactly a reformed seminary. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, so I, I remember studying, and we're, we're studying Bart, yeah. you know, the Bartian theology, Schleiermacher, oh. and and, uh, and all that. And uh, um, it was about 30 minutes to come home from Fuller, yeah. from where I lived in California. And I'm listening to, and I didn't even know who this guy was, R.C. Sproul. And it's 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 renewing your mind. And I'm listening. I go, this guy is fascinating. Yep. And I remember listening to him, writing notes down, uh, writing books down that he recommended, mm-hmm. authors, people, and I'm just like, and then the mm-hmm. light goes went on. This, this is what it means to be reformed. Yep. And it's it's ironic I didn't get that in seminary, um, but I did get that in the teaching series of Legionnaire. Yep. Um, and even when I was at Fuller, I then I started looking and and saying, hey, I'm probably going to go PCA rather than PCUSA. Long story short, I ended up being ordained in the PCUSA to go into the Army chaplaincy yep. to be sort of the the missionary, the idealistic. I'm gonna yep. I'm gonna hold the line, so to speak, within the denomination. And then in time, I realized that the ship was sinking. <laughs> the engines were underwater. Yeah, yeah. a little problematic issues there. And yeah. it's fine. Well, that it, okay. So. RC and that's RC was one of those guys that um my dad introduced me to and I, I he, he introduced me and handed me a cassette tape the holiness of God yeah uh, series and I listened to that and I just I was like oh my gosh and then chosen by God and I was just like oh and it just yeah. it, and then then he introduced me to John MacArthur and I, I mean I just I just dove off him and so um it is fascinating to find when you said Fuller, I just giggled because I'm. I, I think of it. The only other reform guy I can think of that came out of Fuller was Piper. Yeah, uh, John Piper. But I mean, I, I, you got uh, what's his name? Purpose Driven Life guy, uh, Rick Warren. He was he's from Fuller, and then uh, that crazy dude, uh, the emergent fella, Bob. Not Bob. Uh, Rob. 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 Rob Bell. Rob Bell. Rob Bell for Fuller. He's Fuller. And that's scary. He was I, there at the same time. I was. He probably was. Rob Rob Bell was there, and uh, so that's what. So when you say Fuller, I think of those three guys, and now I've got a fourth guy now. <laughs> so um, that is fascinating. <laughs> um, okay, so what what has been? Um, how long have you been pastor at Hope? So July of this year will be five years at Hope. Okay, so you you're you've been there about the same time that I've been at FBC. Okay, uh, Cedarville. Yeah. So that's uh, we're about we're in the same. Same stretch of time. So that is um, what has been some highlights. What have you? Um, I think besides I, meeting me, I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, you know, coming in, the church was a church plan. And what yep. was really, and this is something I saw and my wife saw mm-hmm. from a distance as we're looking at churches, right? right. So um, 
you know, you, you go to the PCA website and you see these churches and you read their, Hey, we're looking for a pastor. And this is, this is who, who the church is. Right. And then I realized, wait a minute, this is a church plant and there's no church plant pastor. This is all lay led. Yeah. You know, these are a group of people yep. from Bartlesville that said, we want a thriving reformed church in Bartlesville yep. and um, we're going to do it ourselves. Now, Pastors from the Presbytery came and preached and did the sacraments and, and all that. But for the most part, it was just lay led. And I kind of stood back from the distance. I looked and I go, that's remarkable. You know, typically you have a church plant pastor who's trained, has a team around him, and they they plan a church. Right. You know, this was all organic, grassroots, lay led, lay, lay developed, right? And, and of course, pastors in the Presbytery had, um, you know, a, a, a factor in that, sure. but, but sure. the momentum really was lay led. And so um, coming into that and realizing um, that I came in as the church plant pastor, but I didn't plan anything. Right. It, 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 the, the groundwork was already, already laid. laid. Yeah. And then, so the church sent me off to um, uh, a church plant assessment that's in our denomination. So yep. they flew Kathy and I to Atlanta and we go through this three or four day training of, yep. and they, they analyze you and they sure. see if you're a good fit to be a church plant pastor and all that. And uh, one of the things they had us do was say, Hey, get up and tell us where your church is. And, you know, so I'd get up and say, well, we've got this going on this like, man, you've done incredible. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I just stepped into it. I this. just walked in. I just, I, I just walked in. So <laughs> then what we did is we particularized. Um, okay. And so what, what are some of the waypoints? I mean, we had, we had, uh, we went from a church plant to a mission church to what we call a particularized church. Let's say, you know, Pinocchio is a wooden doll and he becomes a real boy, a grown yeah. up church. We, we are now a grown oh, up church. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that was certainly one of the waypoints. I mean, COVID was. Oh, dude. Uh, yeah. COVID was a wild COVID thing, wasn't was, it? It was wild. Um, and, you know, it, we had a we had a plan of moving up to Palm Sunday and Easter as a way to kind of launch, so to speak. Yep. And then that was just stymied by COVID. Oh, yeah. uh, and then we're shut down. The interesting thing there and why that is um, an interesting waypoint for me, because, you know, everyone was uncertain. We're like, oh, hey, yeah. hey, you know, let's um, let's uh, stop the, the curve and let's let's yeah. just settle down yep. and two make sure our here. hospitals yeah. two yep. weeks. Yep. Yep. And all of a sudden it just it just kept going. Yeah. And then I realized I drive through Bartlesville to the church. Bartlesville downtown is a ghost town. Yep. I mean, then I'm driving back on Adams and I'm passing Lowe's and the parking lot's full. Yep. And I said, wait, I can buy a shovel and a light bulb at yep. Lowe's, but I can't worship. And I go, something's going. Yep. That was the thing that, that was my, that was my waking up point. As yeah. Well. Yep. And so as soon as we could open, we opened. Yeah. And then ironically, that's where our growth occurred. Come on. Our growth, our, our growth started coming there. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, waypoints, that was one of them. Um, we are we are a church that is not exploding, but we are slowly, consistent, it, consistently yeah. growing. We've got uh, multi generational, you know, um, young families, young people, um, older seniors, and it's just it's it's just beautiful. Yep. Um, and I think that that that's healthy to have a mixture of young people, young couples, and older people as well because if you put a bunch of young people together they're going to blow the thing up because yeah. you're, you're just going to be stupid and you don't have wisdom whereas if you've got a mix of and if you've got all old folks it's yeah. going to die right eventually i mean it's just going to die so having a mix of sage wisdom with youthful passion and energy yeah i think is a is a combustible and, and here's something i i did not expect so I mean, there's there's stereotypes, right? If, yeah. you, if you think of PCA reformed, if you think of this, I mean, this this coffee cup, you know, I mean, it's the coffee that chooses you, you know. <laughs> when, when you think of anything in May Park, you know, right. that's PCA OPC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's the guys with the glasses, the beards, and the bourbon and the cigar, and they want to sure. talk about Spurgeon and yep. Calvin. And yep. So who who comes to a PCA church? People that are diehard PCA. But about 50% of our congregation is not even Presbyterian 
I would say a lot of them I know are Reformed Baptists. Oh, Reformed Baptists, <laughs> but but some aren't even, you know. Some and, are not even that. And, and so it's it's just interesting mm-hmm. how um, that that is not something I expected. Yeah. Um, but it I think it's just a tribute to God's spirit and his word. And, um, you know, so every time I do an infant baptism, I feel like I have to give an apology, not I'm sorry, a type of an apology, but an apology of saying, here's what we're doing and here's why and we're you doing were why it. We're doing and it. here's why we believe what we're doing and so forth. Um, Was that infant a believer? <laughs> yeah. But um, what's interesting is like th- those things are on the wayside. Yeah. They they fall to the side sure. of importance of rather living in Christian community. Yep. Um, um, hearing God's word. There are things that we can disagree with on sure. those things, but they don't divide us. Nope. And and I am just finding that um uh, what people are really craving for is not just finding a church and checking that block and going to church on a Sunday. They want to be in the body. They want to be in covenant community. Yes. They they want to be living their faith with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in the community that they live with. Hundred percent. And that that's as I've hung out with you over the last. I mean, it's it's been about a year and a half now that we've been consistently hanging out, mm-hmm. and and I have um, noticed that sitting at your house, going to the men's fellowships, going to the men, that men's conference you guys had, the fellowship was great loved it and that that's i think that's one of the things that churches don't do well is know how to fellowship and we have like you know southern baptist we have the we have the potlucks and we sit around and we'll talk about the potluck but as soon as we're done we're done mm-hmm. whereas i mean I, I didn't leave hope that friday night till good grief it was almost 11 30 almost midnight and guys were, they didn't want to leave they're just sitting around talking about the deep things of scripture and, right. and talking about I mean, it, it wasn't just, you know, hey, how's work today? It, was, right. it wasn't that kind of stuff. It was splicing apart theological ideas. Right. And, and I felt that I enjoyed that. Yeah. And and that's what, and I've, I've been hanging out with a lot of different um, guys that are Reformed Presbyterians. And, I, and my, my Reformed Baptist friends are like, you're not, you're not jumping ship on us. Are you? No, I'm not jumping ship. I'm still Reformed Baptist. But. It, it's one of those things that, um, which is funny because I grew up Southern Baptist. Right. My dad was a Southern Baptist preacher under Dr. Adrian Rogers. Oh, wow. So, I mean, that's, I mean, literally he was associate pastor of Bellevue. Wow. And so um, th- that was my history as, as SBC. So I, I have ed- tons of SBC roots. So I still have that tendency, but I believe in God's sovereignty. I believe that, I mean, because people are like, well, do you believe in predestination? I'm like, it's in the Bible. Right. So, I mean, the word pre, you know, he predestined. He chose us. Like those are very clear. And I don't think of Paul as a guy that uses slang. Right. I, I, Paul's a guy that's straightforward, right? right. And, and so <laughs> when you hear those, when you hear the word predestined, people immediately go, "Oh, we have this silly idea of free will, of right. what free will actually is." And they're like, "Do you believe in free will?" I'm like, "Sure, I, yeah, yeah, we can say that." Mm-hmm. But what is your will free to do pre Christ? Right. What are you going to choose? You're always going to choose the bad right. because you're born sinful. And people go, oh, and, and this is, and then, uh, then I'll go a little bit further. I'm like, do you believe everybody's going to have? Well, no. Okay. So you believe in limited atonement as well. Mm-hmm. Not everybody's going. So, right. and they're, and just to reframe the question and let them think for a minute and let them sit in it. Oh, okay. Well, maybe, maybe. But then what's what's at the heart of the question is, well, that's not fair. Because see, we need we need oh, almost salvation is um something that we're entitled, mm-hmm. you know, where it's not. No, you know, after the fall, what what do we deserve? What, what's fair? Yeah, no, we what's don't want to talk about fair. I don't want what's fair. We don't want to talk about justice. If you, you know? get justice, if it's fair, you're going to get justice, and justice is hell. Right. And and people say, well, that's not fair. You know that he wouldn't choose. It. Uh, okay, as Doctor Steve Lawson said, it that he chose anybody is a, is a testimony. Well, it, right. Why did why? Instead of saying, why does he choose some? Why did he choose any? Right. And then you go one step deeper. Why did he choose you? Right. I, I don't know. 
I don't know. Aren't you? But aren't you thankful? Yeah. Because how many people in Bartlesville, Oklahoma today have no cognitive thought about their own sin? They have no just yearning for the things of Jesus. There's no, there's no, oh, man, I mean, I mean, I wake up thinking about these things and I'm like, I'm just so excited that God chose to awaken me to the reality that I need him, that I'm yeah. sinful and that I need a, a, a redeemer. Right. Like, cause there's so many people that, that I interact with, not even on their radar. Well, it's, it's like what, what Jesus said, he's talking to his disciples and they say to him, well, if that's the case, then who can be saved? Yeah. And he says, apart from God, no, no one it's, it's, this is, and yet God has made that available. God has exactly. not, not just available. He's 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 done the work in it. He it's God's grace and mercy. And so many times you hear this straw man argument about reformed theology that somehow you're chosen because you're special. Yeah. Somehow you're chosen because you're nope. the elite. And it's nope. it's just the opposite. It's like, can you understand that it's just pure grace? That's it. And and this is where I even go further is when people start to gripe about this, I'm like, I don't know who's chosen and who's not. So it's rather than griping about it's not fair, why don't you go share your faith with somebody? Because maybe God's going to use you as the missionary yeah. to ignite that person's heart. Right. And your na- your uncle, your cousin, your sister, whoever, right. maybe God's going to use you rather than sitting around going, well, let's, let's debate this. Rather than debate it, I it, like this Reformed theology gives me such boldness because Jesus wins. Right. And we win in the end because of what Christ has done. So it's like fishing and shooting in a barrel. Just, all right, yeah. God will take care of it. You just go be be faithful to to share the word and your testimony Those, right. in, in that order. We are called to be faithful and we are called to be participants yeah. in his kingdom work. But it's his spirit that carries it. That's out. it. Yeah. And so it's, it's Caleb Gordon. <laughs> Peter Johnson does not save. We don't, we, I can barely keep track of my phone. Right. So, I mean, there's, I don't save anybody, but Jesus does. And so what do I do? I want to point people to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit do the rest of the work. Yeah. I, all I'm doing is that guy over there. Right. You see him? Open your Bibles. Here, here he is right here. And let Jesus do the work. And so rather than gripe about it, and, and if they're, well, what if they reject? Okay, then. Move on to the next one. Planet seed, yeah, or the, or they reject it. I mean, how how many people have we witnessed to that have just been stone walls? Yeah, you know nothing. And then you it. find out. I had just had this conversation with a gentleman. Um, he, I, I, wrote, I wrote an article, and the title of it was "Make Bartlesville Christian Again." Yeah. And this guy sends me a message in fr- private message. He was an atheist, and he the type this starts the conversation with, "Hey, brother Caleb, brother Caleb, brother Caleb." And I read through it and he's like, I love your article. You need to come meet my pastor. I was like, are you on drugs? Mm-hmm. Like, what has happened? <laughs> come to find out he's been saved. And I'm like, yes, this wow. is awesome. And so we're, um, we're, so we're pri- prior previously yes. as an atheist. I, and he did not yeah. like me. He yeah. said I was too Jesus pushy. Yeah. Yeah, of course I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, some like to say, well, you know, I wasn't. During that season of my life, I wasn't post mill, but I, I now that I've come to understand, I like post mill. So I just so you're I, a post mill I'm, Reformed Baptist. I here I am. Wow. I shh, don't tell anybody. So there's post- another name for that. Yeah, that's <laughs> almost Presbyterian. Almost Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. no, it, it's one of those things that I'm like, wow. Um, Jesus wins. And so, yeah. I, the, and that he's called me in to be a part of this. Right. Like, this is the amazing thing is that God's called us to have, play a part. Like, right. what's that? Put me in, coach. You know, right. I'm ready to play. And, and yeah. he hasn't called you in to fail, meaning yeah. that you're going to witness to someone and you're going to say the wrong thing. Absolutely. And therefore, they're going to deny the gospel and Caleb's responsible for nope. it. Nope. No, he's putting you in to win, meaning... You're faithful to his nope. word. Nope. You're faithful to the faith. And, and it, it may not be to, because when do we want to see somebody saved? Like exactly, that. right? Immediate. That may take 10 years. That's right. And you're one part of the seed where my dad was one of those. So my dad shared the gospel with my granddad for years. Mm-hmm. Just he was a he was an old rugged farmer that said, I'm I don't need Jesus. I'm good enough on my own. 
yeah. that just had that mindset, right? Dad laid the seeds, laid the seeds at the at the kitchen table at two and three o'clock in the morning, pounding on the table, pleading with my granddad to come to Christ. Mm-hmm. It snows one Sunday when we go help him feed the cattle. And I'm sitting in the car and, I, and I'm 11 year old Caleb. I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. I just, I just go, Hey, grandpa, do you know if you're going to heaven? I don't know, Caleb. Did you know you can know for sure? 11 year old childlike faith, Caleb. All you got to do is ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. He'll totally do it. Well, how does it, how's that work, Caleb? You just pray something like this, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. And just, I just led him through a simple prayer. Wow. Simple prayer. You didn't pound your fist on the No, seat. I just, it's like, I want, I just, I want you to go to heaven, grandpa. No. Do, you, do you know if you're going? I don't know. It's like, but you can know. I was like, all you could do is ask him to forgive you and he will. Yeah. And he prayed in the car. Is this Oklahoma? Oklahoma? Yeah, he's here. Wow. Prayed, had had lung cancer. Yeah. Prayed with him. He repents of his sins in the car with 11 year old Caleb. Gets out of the car. I jump out of the car, 11 year old Tigger Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saved. And theological dad's like, sure he did. Yeah, yeah sure. And I saved and, him. And he looks right at Sonoma like, he just prayed to ask Jesus to forgive him of his sins, yeah. dad. And yeah. and um, he gets out with tears coming down his face. He really? grabs my dad and said, I'm sa- I've been saved. Wow. And how many years had dad been pleading with him? No. And, but it yeah. wasn't a, it wasn't a failure. He's planting seeds the whole time. That's right. And the Holy Spirit was doing the work through the power of his word. An eleven year old boy was part of that kingdom yeah. work. Yeah. And just and I, in my childlike faith and belief that I believe Jesus can save my grandpa. Yeah. I believe that. And he got saved. See, it reminds me when uh I was in college, Southern California, big mall. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna storm this mall. It's about 50 from the college group. We're in the parking lot. We're holding hands. We're praying. Mom, I am deathly afraid. Oh, terrifying. I mean, yeah. Sharing your faith is absolutely one of the most terrifying share, things. I'm like, this, this is the first time I'm really going to share my faith with total strangers. And it's going through a mall, people shopping, people being cool. And you're going to say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? And, you know. No, no you can't. So. And, and in California, of all places. And, and in Southern California, <laughs> of all places. So he, here we are in this mall, multi-level. Yeah. You see people at work. I see open Bibles and I'm like, man, they're doing it. And I'm walking around my hands in my pocket. I'm like, okay, there's my victim. That's <laughs> my victim. And I'm like, uh, excuse me, sir. He's like, yeah. And then I'm like, then I just <laughs> fall. Okay. Uh, do you have the time? He's like, yeah, it's 8.30. I'm like, okay. Well, we're going to storm this mall for like two and a half hours. And like 10 o'clock at night yeah. when it closes, we're going to reconvene yeah. in the parking lot. And I have talked. To no one. to nobody, and then I'm down in the corner of the mall. The mall is starting to shut up and uh, you know shut down, and you know those little kiosks where they sell sunglasses. Yep. This is, of course, in the late '80s, and uh, sunglasses. That wow. Yeah, I know there was no cell phones then, and there's this young woman, and she's shutting down her sunglass hut. Yep, and I'm kind of just in the corner, just you know, thinking, "Great, I'm going to get back." Hey, Pete, who did you talk to? Nobody, no one. And she goes, "Oh, what what are you selling?" I remember she asked me that question and I felt, I didn't say it this way, but this is how I felt. You know, I just felt like I'm not here to sell anything, but to present the free gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, you know <laughs> just like, dude, to say the most dorkiest the thing, like, like it wasn't oh, smooth. Yeah. It wasn't profound. Nope. It was just dumb. And I said that, and I am not exaggerating. When I said that, she just stopped. Her eyes welled up with tears. Come on. She slowly dropped to her knees and she started crying. And I prayed with her. And that's I mean, awesome. so that's the work of the spirit. It is. And 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 what did I mention? I mentioned the gospel of Jesus Christ, who was working in her life. What was the spirit doing? The point that I'm making, it, it wasn't this profound, smooth presentation of the gospel. Not that that isn't important. Yeah, it, it is. It, it, it is. should be. Yes. Yeah, but, some, but God takes this, the foolishness of okay. man. That's right. That's right. And, yeah. but, but to say... I evangelized this woman. I discipled her. No, I was just a participant. You just, you just were a present. Yeah, yeah. you're a warm it's, it's body. It's the means that the Holy Spirit. Who gets uses. the glory out of that, though? God. Yeah, God, not Pete. Right, but God, and that's how that's how it should be. We shouldn't be trying to get the glory out of this stuff. Like it, we went to, we were at Arby's uh, right around Easter. Yeah. Went through the drive through. It was about eight o'clock at night, yeah. and I had a gospel track in a, in a small 
Bible in my center console. And I've been handing those out and I handed it to the lady at the, in the drive-thru and she comes back and she goes, I'm sorry, can I ask you questions? And yeah, she, was that a Bible you gave me? I said, it sure was. And it said gospel tracts on there too. She, she starts just bawling. Same thing. Yeah. just starts bawling. And I was like, what's wrong? She goes, you're the second person today <laughs> that has handed oh, wow. me a Bible oh. and told me, and, I, and and this neighbor of mine is taking me to church on Sunday. Oh my gosh. I think God's trying to get my attention. I was yeah. like, yeah, he is. Yeah. Yeah. He is trying to get your attention. Right. And, and so I'm like, I didn't. Who gets the glory out of that? That's right. Not me. I just hand. All I did was hand her a Bible. Right. And and it is scary. I, I I'm not I'm not gonna pull those punches. It's nope. scary to it absolutely people. is. And a, another thing which is really important when we look at our our church and the growth, it's just a slow, steady growth. Um, but you know, we put billboards up. We want sure. people to know. But where where are people coming from? And just like we can be hesitant to evangelize because it's scary, yep. um, but it's God's work inviting people to church oh. when i realize who's coming to the church is because we got great brothers and sisters in christ who are inviting their neighbors yep. and inviting people to church yep. and you think it won't work hey caleb you want to come to church man Pete, who do you think i don't go to church yep. get out of my business you're like oh he invited me i'll go yeah but you know what it, changes when someone shows up and hears the gospel that's it and that's that's one of the wildest things is if you ask people to go to church with you a lot of times they're going to say yes yeah and this is and this is another misconception in Reformed theology. Oh, so you believe in predestination. So what's the point? So you don't believe in evangelism. Oh, no, no, no. Because I am Reformed, right. I absolutely believe in evangelism right. because I know that Jesus went. That's right. And so because of that, that gives me the boldness. Now, am I am I gonna be am I gonna flub it up and say something stupid? Are yes. you gonna absolutely <laughs> this is the beauty? You're fine. This is the beauty of the gospel and the power of the Holy spirit is that Jesus is the one that does the work. And there's not, and I always tell people there's no magic formula. There's no magic prayer that you have to pray. Cause if we, if, if we, if it's a magic word that we recite, we're right. witches, right? We're, we're not Christians. Right. It, it's the position of your heart. I always tell people, what do you want God to do? I want God to save me. Okay. Then express that, right. e express that not to me, yeah. but to the father. Right. And I, you know, I've seen people who, who pray and they're just like, Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm just a mess. And I, mm -hmm. I need you just, I need salvation. I need forgiveness. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, cool. Do you believe you saved? I, I, yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Well, it's just, we're going to, now we're, now begins the work of discipleship. Right. Growing you in your faith. Right. Uh, you know, and I know that there's different People that have evangel, you know, evangel, evangelism and all those different things, but I think discipleship is also a smart thing to to be a part of to have that. Oh yeah, and and figuring out what that is. Yeah, and that's I mean that's that's one thing. Um, Shane Pennington, associate pastor, and I have been talking about is you know what is discipleship? Yeah, what what does that really growing look in like? your faith? Growing in your faith, and um, and that can look different. Like, listen, because certain people say, okay, all right, does that mean I grab my Bible and now I'm going to start reading? Okay, yeah, you're going to read, but like discipleship can look like us sitting here together mm -hmm. and, and having the conversations about the text. Or maybe you do better just reading it. Okay, great. Get get a good study Bible. Get something that's going to help you grow and walk with Jesus closer. But maybe it's a podcast. Maybe, I mean, it's this is the beauty of technology. We have it. Yeah. Use it. So. We have our men's lunch at Bambino's. It's a Bible study yep. at 1130 every Thursday at Bambino's. And, you know, we're, we're going over first and second Timothy and yep. you look at how Paul is discipling Timothy. Yep. That's, that's what it's, it's knowledge. It's, it's teaching, it's coming alongside, but it's also these means of grace that God has given us in his word and prayer and the Lord's supper. And it just, it's, it's being immersed in that Christian body right of, yep. of god's word and knowledge and and doctrine and and you know so many times that you know paul tells timothy to defend the good doctrine to know the good doctrine to build on that yes you know, that's yes um and it's and when i say that i'm not talking merely head knowledge but that's that's the framework of the truth of the gospel that that we gotta rest the foundation of. amen that's so. it Hundred percent, I love it. All right, so if somebody's interested in finding out more about Hope Presbyterian, where do they go? How do they find more information? 
Um, we got. Because I know you're a big, you're a big social media guy. I know you're you're huge. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. He's I'm not, not a technical guy he's, either. He's, I don't even know how to run this thing. Yeah, it's, on it's, it. a, yeah. it's a screen. Yeah. yeah. Thank God for technical people. Yeah. <laughs> so we are um, downtown. Yep. Um, Hope. Presbyterian Church. We're right across the street from the Episcopal Church, just south of the Performance Arts Center yep. between Osage and Dewey, 9th and 10th. Um, we have a website. We're on YouTube. You can live stream us. And we are now putting just our sermons on Spotify. Yep. It's Hope Presbyterian Sermons. You'll see that on, on Spotify. Cool. Um, 1030 Sunday mornings. We'd okay. love to have anyone who would love to come. Love it. Well, thanks for coming on and talking to me today. Caleb, thanks for having me, bro. Yeah.